27, 1842. Opening day had arrived. We children crowded into wagons, hugging our new books and slates. Through rain showers and across the treeless plains, we headed for Punahou on the first day of school. We finally reached the gray stone wall of the school, six feet high and four broad. In the middle of the white one-story building between two green veranda posts, the tall, dignified principal, Mr. Daniel Dole. As designated principal, I would like to say that should any of the children wish to become teachers, mechanics, merchants, or farmers, we wish to give them an education that will make them highly useful and respectable in these several professions. We also think that it is important that they may all know something of agriculture, so they will regularly, regularly devote a part of each day to the cultivation of the soil. As the wife of the principal, may I add that the course of female education in this school will be to prepare our female well, to be, prepare our females for the most high usefulness. In this delightful retreat, habits of patient and productive labor must be formed. Beside Mr. Dole stood the formidable Miss Marsha Smith from the 8th Missionary Company, who would be his assistant. Each student greeted them respectfully. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. We rang the bell at 9 o'clock. The students entered to find rows of green desks with lids that lifted and with seats attached. The students took their places and all was quiet. With their Bibles before us, we read in turn. And before we took out our slates, Mr. Dole prayed, asking God's blessing on this school. Bless these children and this school. Amen. 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 We are to be educated in our heads, our hearts, and our hands. At recess, there were two turkeys, a flock of chickens, and a litter of pigs to visit. Some of us smaller children used the low, tangled branches of a how tree to play ship. I am happy to say that I have never seen more interesting children. What a grand place this is for them to grow up. There are streams to swim and dive into, mountains and hills to ramble through on great adventures, and a school to challenge their minds. Below the playground is a little brook, and beyond that, the boys' farm. There was the cornfield, here the banana field. Yonder, the beds of beets and carrots, turnips and radishes. And above the brook on this side, the mimosa grove. And oh, the spring. I must not forget the spring. At noontime, we would start with our dinner pails in hand and go to the spring, stopping on the way to gather the buds of the morning glory, tearing them apart to see the beautiful, delicate pink color, or plucking a tarot leaf. Stop by the brook and put a little water in it to see the silver globules roll around the smooth surface like mercury in a saucer. At last, we reached the spring and seated ourselves on the broad, flat stones by the brink. We paddled our feet in the clear, cool water or waded out and collected soft green moss. At the end of that first school day, Daniel Dole's quill traces these words in his diary. Punahou, July 11th, 1842. School commenced. Present in school today were Ormel, John, Charles, and William Gulick, Samuel and William Emerson, William, Richard, and Mary Jane Armstrong, James, Levi, Maria, and Martha Ann Chamberlain, Mary Dimond, and Sophia Hall, 15 in all. Although they were sons and daughters of missionaries, and the scriptures played an important part in our lives, they were, most of all, boys and girls, living in the Sandwich Islands during the 1840s and 50s. Because we were missionary children, we dressed in very simple clothing, which our mothers often showed by hand. Our trousers were made of the cheapest dark blue denim, with two or three tucks in the legs to allow for our growth. 
I can't tell you how we felt when these bands were let out after many washings and they left a series of humiliating bright blue bands around our ankles. We wore belted dresses and long, plain pantalets to our ankles. Our one real luxury was that of being barefooted all year round, wearing shoes on Sunday only and then under protest. Whenever I hear the ringing of a bell, I can see us all, barefoot and armed with gardening tools, trooping out to work the fields before daylight. We not only learned Greek and Latin at Punahou, but we learned how to work a field. Father Rice made everyone move. He kept us healthy by constantly requiring us to exterminate the weeds of Bermuda grass that were such pests in our plantation. A few of us tried to plant our own gardens or pulianas on the lower slopes of Rocky Hill. The lack of water there made gardening difficult, and then we had to battle against the wild hogs, which often uprooted our cucumbers, carrots, and peanuts. In the evenings, we were required to work in our patches until we could count seven stars. I don't think any of us studied the heavens as closely as we did then. We were often asked to write compositions in the morning and then read them aloud to our fellow classmates in the afternoon. The Lazy Boy. The first great difficulty of the lazy boy in learning and composition is he does not wish to. This is the sort of study which taxes his brain, the very thing which he likes least to do. So he sits about half an hour thinking whether he will or will not, and at the end of that time, he concludes he will not. He soon called by the teacher of the school and asked why he does not write his composition. He sits at his desk looking the very picture of idleness. When we weren't working in the classrooms or in the fields, we liked to play. Dancing was banned and marbles, chess, and cards were taboo because they were games used for gambling. Those of us older boys were passionately fond of open air sports such as prisoner's base and icony, a form of baseball. Bat and ball was a standard game of those days. Both Judge Lee and Mr. Charles Bishop used to come up on Saturdays to have a game of ball with all of us enthusiastic young boys. Mr. Goal was a great batter. He would throw the ball into the air, and as it fell, with the swing of the whole body, he would hit it with the, the report of a pistol, sending it straight into the air, almost out of our sight. We made our own balls and bats. On Saturdays, we would tramp out in Sumanoa Valley and cut straight kukui and how branches. When we returned to Pinho, we would prepare our bats by peeling off the kukui, by peeling off the bark, and then laying them in the sun to dry. We had food toys to play with, but we enjoyed walking on stilts, swinging tops, dumping rope, and swinging. We also loved running and jumping matches, swimming, and tug of war, which we always played to the shrieking delight of the onlooking boys and girls. to make sleds and went sliding at breakneck speed down a slippery peely grass on a steep slopes of round top. A stone or a hillock or a cross trail would often toss us high in the air, but it only added to the sport. Foot racing is a sport much in favor these days. Our greatest runner is Ormel Gulick. The next, William DeWitt Alexander. Once, in racing to the gate with Ormel, William threw his right hit out of joint. <sighs> Dr. Rice had to be caught, and then Mr. Judd carried him back to the house. William DeWitt became a hero to all of us small boys, and we discussed how we could dislocate our own hips while racing before the admiring school. For the past few weeks, we have all enjoyed Mr. Atkinson, a fine singer and a fine, manly young fellow just out of seminary school. 
He has made our acquaintance as our music teacher during a layover on the islands on his way to Oregon. He has held singing classes for us nearly two hours a week. The melody of his voice delights us. newspaper was the Purho Gazette. September 7, 1848. There were only one handwritten copy to be issued every Thursday afternoon, and whoever of our friends would like to hear it will do well to call at the public hall between the hours of 2 and 4. Everyone is respectfully requested to attend at the weekly reading. Rocky Hill. There is a small hill back of Punahou, which is very rocky, and for that reason, the Punahou boys gave it the name of Rocky Hill. The sides are covered with cliffs about 40 or 50 feet high. Sometimes on Saturday, the boys go up to Rocky Hill and roll down the great rocks over the cliffs, which come down with a great crash. There are also some magnificent caves there which the boys have found. Some boys explore the caves looking for wooden idols and ghosts. There are some wild cats which make their dwellings in the caves. As the editor of The Critic, it is my task each week to criticize, criticize compositions of the previous issue of the Gazette. <coughs> Several compositions were received by the Gazette last week for which we would like to thank the writers. There was one anonymous piece that we think must have been better understood by its writer than it was by us. We would thank writers of such pieces if they would provide us with a dictionary of hieroglyphics and a pair of spectacles so we may be able to decipher them. There are several things in our mind which we think constitute a well-written composition. Firstly, is handwriting. It should be written with great care in a plain and legible hand. Secondly, is spelling. Everybody ought to be exceedingly careful in his spelling. And thirdly, but not least, is style. Persons ought to write in a flowing, elegant, and easy style. An elegant, easy style is much more entertaining to its readers. If these few lines shall be the means of aiding anybody in the art of writing compositions, the editorial staff will feel amply repaid. Mr. Somebody. Mr. Somebody is a very troublesome fellow. If you should come to our school some morning, soon after, soon after it is commenced, you would pretty soon hear one say, Mr. Dole, I lost my slate. Another ball's out. Mr. Dole, someone has stolen my geography. <laughs> this is Mr. Somebody, who takes a greater fancy to some persons than he does to others. I know one person who is troubled by him almost every day, and another I know who he has not troubled at all. Now I will tell you why. Because one of them keeps his desk all in disorder. His books lay scattered all about his desk and the desks around him. And some of them are on the floor. His desk, I suppose, is so full of dirt that he has not room to get his books in. While the other keeps his in perfect order. A place for everything and everything in its place. I will now state to you some of Mr. Somebody's qualities. He is invisible. He is a ghost because he is never seen. He is very dirty because he seldom takes anything out of a clean person's desk. I have filled my page now and must stop. Miss Smith abhorred shiftlessness and labored to impress upon us the inestimable value of time. Miss Smith forbade our playing at noon with the girls, saying that we are very uncivil and ungentlemanly. We were constantly told by Miss Smith how much brighter the children in the States were, how much better they did in their studies in every way than these children here in the islands. In Miss Smith's hour, when she was going to give us a recess, she had each go out by turn and make a bow as they went. I suppose that's proper, though I never did it before.
the diligent girl and the dilatory girl. A diligent girl is one who, when she had anything to do, does it quickly and well. She attends to her work and does not suffer her attention to be, to be diverted from her work by every little thing. Neither is she laughing and talking all the time. She does her work quietly and faithfully, that is, well. She does not leave the dishes all wet on the bottom, the table all covered with slops, or the sides of the pan covered with grease. She is generally orderly. If washing dishes, she does not put the cups away where the plates belong, or the spoons where the fork should be. She keeps her room in such order that she is not ashamed to have anyone go into it. She is neat, too, in her personal appearance. When she comes to the table, her hair is not at all in disorder. In short, she seems to make it her aim to be diligent and faithful in all that she undertakes. I am well acquainted with a diligent girl and one who is not very diligent. When the dilatory girl comes to the table, her hair is all in disorder and her face and dress are very dirty. She is always tardy, too, at school. She is disliked by all her acquaintances and, as well, her manners are disagreeable. The diligent girl's manners are agreeable and she is beloved because she loves others. pond, filled with living water from the spring. Here, we spent 15 or 20 minutes of delight, splashing, swimming, and diving like porpoises. Examination days came at the end of each term. Always a festive occasion, we dressed in our Sunday best. The examining committee sat on a platform to ask us questions, and we did our best to face this ordeal. In front of the guests, visitors, and trustees, we were asked questions in Greek and geography, did sums in algebra on a blackboard, gave speeches in Latin, or read our compositions aloud. A pale light glows through the deep set windows of the middle adobe wing. Inside, alert and ready for the contest, are the faces of some 18 youths, one standing and speaking, the others looking forward in their chairs. Tis hard that I, for six long hours, should try to improve my mental powers, while some there are who, at my age, can't read nor write a single page. I'd rather chase the butterfly that flits around so greedily, or eat and drink, or play or sleep, than to stay here from day to day and waste my time in school. Tis hard that none will play with me, for misery loves company. From day to day, from week to week, I can't my own enjoyment seek, but keep dozing over on my book, afraid to meet my teacher's look. The time I hope's not distant far when steady I shall leave. The tones of yonder bell shall jar my tender ears no more. It was near the middle of the forenoon in one examination period when a little ten-year-old girl in a low-necked white frock quietly entered the schoolroom. I began sitting up very straight and eagerly whispering among my companions, inquiring who might be this maiden fair. I soon learned that she was the sister of my roommate. Charm I can't explain about a girl I've seen. My heart beats fast when she goes past in a dress all trimmed with green. Her eyes are bright as the evening stars, so loving and so shy. And the folks all stop and look around whenever she goes by. The anxiety which accompanied these examinations was relieved when Miss Smith led us in singing at the end of each hour. Music in the valley, music on the Beginning in 1851, we founded a number of debating societies. We met in the evenings, and fierce discussions were frequently carried on for over an hour and a half, our time limit. 
Our questions vary. Shall women have equal rights? Does the reading of novels have a bad effect on the reader? Ought theater to be abolished? Is it right to dance? Our debates might have been more profitable as mental gymnastics if they had been supervised by mature people than our own. But it would have spoiled the fun. I believe that I gained more educationally from those crude debates and interchanges of thought and opinion than from any other course in our curriculum of study. As the first generation of Punahou boys grew up and set sail for the East Coast, leaving the original small boys as the seniors. We were curious to see how we would measure up to the American boys. After all, Miss Smith had constantly told us how much better the children in the States were and how much better they did than us in every way. Well, we have discovered that the boys in the States are not quite as good as Miss Smith used to re represent them. I have seen them work and I have worked with them too. But you just give me a garden tool and a patch of potatoes and I can beat them. There is no, nobody here that I have been swimming with that can swim as far as I can or do tricks in the water like the boys back home. I've just finished my first day trial at the academy here, and I'm in the first class. I guess I can beat any of them easily in Greek or Latin. The, the scholars here are no smarter than us Puno scholars. Indeed, the academy here is in no respect equal to the Puno Academy. Indeed, their success abroad is noted in the New York Observer. Valedictorian, salutatorian, and the highest honors were often theirs in Eastern colleges. A remarkable set of youth were educated at Punahou during its first years. Their subsequent careers fulfilled the promise of their youth in agriculture, in commerce, in education, in medicine, in law, in science, in statesmanship, in fidelity, to humble or high trusts. They have done honor to themselves and the school from which they came. And so, the legacy of Punahou continues. 175 years later, we are humbled and honored to call ourselves Punahou students. We hope to do justice to those who came before us and to set a positive example for those who will follow in our footsteps. Those first missionaries spoke these words. This school shall be a spring of wisdom. As the hollow tree stands firm through the wind of storm, so shall the children of this school stand strong and brave through joy and sorrow. And just as the hollow tree has many uses, so shall the children educated at this school be useful to Hawaii. As Dr. Scott reminds graduating seniors, to whom much is given, much is expected. As Punahou students, we hope to bring honor to our school, Ku'u Punahou, and to leave this world a better place than when we found it.